Welcome to Martial Wisdom. Here you can listen to conversations on all kinds of topics related to martial arts. In today's episode, I'm thrilled to have Remy Helgeson back on the show. We're going to talk about real-world violence and how it applies to Aikido training. Two major things that I want to mention before we get started today. First, I want to express my heartfelt thanks to the listeners who have donated through the PayPal tip jar. Your contributions are greatly appreciated. It's the love of the martial arts which keeps us doing what we do, and at the same time, it's true for producing the content that I do on this channel. Thank you very much for your support. Second, it's been several years now since I launched the Spirit Aikido online program. Releasing new videos every few days over that time has resulted in a very large library of material. There are currently over 315 videos in the program, with more being added constantly. This is a great way for you to get training and practice ideas which I've gathered from my own Aikido training, gleaned from other instructors, and taken from other arts. In the most recent videos I've covered reliable and powerful choke defenses, head control techniques, and dealing with a flailing attacker, something which is very relevant to the topic of today's podcast. If you've been curious to see breakdowns of how I approach my Aikido on the mat, the videos in the Spirit Aikido online program are the best way to go. You get a great deal of content and help support the show at the same time. I encourage you to check it out. There's a link in the description. I hope you enjoy this episode. Now, on with the discussion. I want to welcome Remy Helgeson back to the show. It's been a little bit uh, since we've had him on, and, and I've got a topic that's going to land right in his wheelhouse, and that is uh, real fighting and real violence of what it's what it's like. As martial artists, that's the realm that we claim to be training ourselves for and preparing ourselves for, but oftentimes uh, there's a lot of myths going around. There's a lot of misperceptions and, and just outright falsehoods about what real violence is involved with and, and what therefore what it would take to train to prepare for it properly um so that's welcome back remy i'm looking forward to this discussion thank you and likewise cool cool i always love when we chat and, and remy is a, a kind of a world traveler so it's sometimes uh we go for long periods when he's off traveling the world and and then he comes back and we get to chat so looking forward to it um yeah you know Within the martial arts world, yes, there are practitioners that like to train for exercise and for spiritual growth and, and things like that, but, and, and that stuff is fine, but really martial arts, the frame of martial arts is understanding violence. And in my opinion, that is kind of the, the, the real, the, the rallying flag that, that brings everybody together. And yes, you can practice martial arts for those other benefits, but the, the, when the rubber meets the road, when somebody takes a swing at you, you better be ready to deal with it. And that's kind of my own my own view of it. And I know a lot of martial artists feel the same way. And, and I think you do, Remy. And that's why that's why I love chatting with you so much. Absolutely. Likewise. Awesome. And for those who don't know Remy's background, he is he works as a, a professional in security and has worked with and been in the environments of real violence uh, for many, many years, which is why I wanted to bring him on. I've got a high regard for people that work with violence on a daily basis as their profession because they have a, a level of reality that they are dealing with. That it's not what some instructor made up or what somebody believes violence to be or they watched a lot of movies or something. They deal with real people at, uh, on a day to day basis. So I always like them as first, uh, what do you call it, first generation sources of information. Like to me, that is the, that is the, the ultimate uh, testament to what reality is like in terms of violence. Um, and I think one of the things I'd like to address first is that real fights are not like sport fights. Um, they have many similarities, but there are some drastic differences. And I'd like to dig in a little bit to what those are. And I think the first myth, I should say myth, but it's a great misunderstanding is when people say, well, rules and no rules like that's they encapsulate all the differences of real fighting and sport fighting to rules so would you like to start on your take on the argument about rules being the difference the only difference between real violence and and sport fighting uh yeah obviously uh, no rules plays a big role uh if you're a good fighter in sports you can do good in self-defense and in combat uh, it's just a little bit more brutal and uh, more chaotic. Um, 
whoever comes the, the best prepared for a fight has most likely the best outcome. But at the same time, anything can happen. Anything can blindside you. Uh, how much tunnel vision do you have when the adrenaline is pumping, uh, when the stress levels are up? Uh, how much awareness can you have when it's dark, uh, shady alleys, people around you? Geographically speaking, there's a lot of violence uh, in the neighborhood or around this area. How much can you put your martial center in real life uh, in the worst scenarios as much as when you're in the dojo and it's easier to breathe with the lower belly and you know your partners are not going to hurt you drastically and it's safer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that one of the things that I observe with sport fights, and this is one of the things that makes them entertaining to watch, and that is that sport fighting tends to give the advantage to the more precise uh, fighter. Precision and skill really is what makes a, a supreme or an elite level fighter. And every competitor, and I used to compete for many decades, will tell you the same thing, though you get that level of focus and precision and skill when you are not distracted, when you are not panicked, when you are prepared. And these are things that a professional fighter or a sport fighter gets the benefit of. They aren't distracted by when the fight starts. They know exactly when it starts. They know who their opponent is. They know how they get advanced warning of who their opponent's going to be. They often get to train and prepare for exactly that, that opponent. They know that there are limits that will make sure that they end up safe or, or relatively safe in the fight. They're not going to get brutalized by four or five people. Um, so those distractions are taken off the table for a sport fighter. They only have to concentrate on their skill and precision, um, making the right tactical choices in that contained environment. And I think one of the things that makes things extremely difficult for a real fight is one, you really don't know what you're going to be up against, whether it's going to be, you know, somebody much bigger than you, three, four, five people, whether you're going to start ha having already had half a pitcher of beer, you don't know when the, when yelling and screaming is going to turn into the fight actually going physical. Um, you don't know if you're going to get ambushed from behind. Um, like you were talking about, it could be dark, could be you know, raining, could be all kinds of conditions. You could be exhausted going to your car in a parking lot. Um, no notice whatsoever, total ambush. <clears throat> and I think <clears throat> some of these complexities explain why successful sport fighters have been, have been beaten in a street fight um, because they, they were, had other things on their mind than focusing their, their skill and their precision on an opponent. It's not just your technique. And I think we martial artists get drawn into just how, how great can we make our technique and we ignore a lot of these other facts. And uh, one of the things that you know, we hear all the time is just, well, awareness. You got to have a situational awareness, which is a great catchword, and it's true. But it's very hard to train for that. And we martial artists really don't train for that. We give it lip service, but we don't really appreciate building that skill. And, I, and in my opinion, one of the best ways to build the skill is to go out into the wild and practice your awareness. Um, observance of things like exits and trying to read people and pr profile them. And I, I know the word profiling has gotten kind of a bad rap uh, in the last few decades, but, you know, really profiling is just kind of getting a read on people and seeing if they s seem to be going to pose trouble or not. Um, and I'm sure a professional profiling is huge. Yeah. I mean, uh, you got to go through patterns, you know, you see patterns out there, you see good patterns, bad patterns, this resemblances of, of situations you've seen before. You've got the gut feeling. Uh, you you uh, spoke of precision. You know, how precise can you be when, when it's uh, chaotic? Um, awareness is one thing, but knowing what to do tactically is a whole other uh, thing to train with. You know, uh, let's say it, it, it pops off. You, you just left the gym and you're, like you said, you're tired. You haven't really eaten. Maybe your blood sugar is down. Your focus is not 100% up. Uh, someone wants your wallet or something else. And, uh, you know, you got to make a couple of decisions, you know, tactical decisions. Uh, is this guy alone? Uh, exits, you know, if you uh, commit into situations, what do you do afterwards? How do you evaluate it legally? 
because, uh, you know, uh, that's a big thing too, uh, unless you're somewhere where you, nobody's going to hear about it. But, um, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of different stuff that you have to have already trained for before you get to that situation. And being a good fighter in gym is, is sure, it's good. But when you come out there and if you bring it, uh, if you're not humble to reality, you know, it doesn't matter the size of a guy if he pulls out a knife. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter the size of the guy if he comes behind you and clocks you with a, a bottle when his buddy is distracting you and smiling and like playing tricks with you and then they run up on you from behind. Uh, it's, it's a very, very foul world and there really is no rules and it's, it's getting worse by the day. So staying humble, you know, training for reality as much as for the gym, you know, weapons and stuff like that. It's really hard to take a knife from, from someone. So if a knife is pulled, it's either give the wallet, run, or you put your life into the situation if you uh, if you decide to do that. So, um, yeah, it's – and there's no – you get knocked down with a knife and then you stand up again. You could lose your life or cut severely, and uh, it could be very tragic. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, reality is brutal. It could be brutal. It could could be anything, like you said. It's just a lot of distractions are chaotic, and there's ta tactical measurements. There's a lot of things to consider that you don't have in a gym. And, uh, of course, situational awareness. You don't want to end up in a physical conflict. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't have a choice, even though you're super spiritual and you've got the quantum physics working for you and whatnot. But it, it's just bound to happen sometimes because – the world is the world and it, you know it's just how it is you know years ago a friend of mine uh who's a, a muay thai fighter really really good one boxer uh he and i got to talk and he also is in a profession of security and i remember one of the most profound things he i remember him saying was you know i'll get into a ring with anybody and and not be i mean he was good but not invincible but he knew the reason he said that was because I know the limits. I know what we're dealing with in there. But he said, a real, a real fight? I have no idea what's going to happen or what could happen. I don't know if somebody could be armed. I don't know if suddenly I could be dealing with three, four, five people. I don't know. There's so many things that are beyond beyond the, the normal limits of what a, you know a, a ring would be. And you know, you know that if you do step into a ring that your opponent, when you when you hit the canvas is going to back off. You don't know that, you know, in, in reality, he's like, I, and I don't want to, I don't want to deal with any of that. Now, granted, because he worked in security, he took on a profession where he was, he had the training and the skill to deal with it if it happened, but his mind was of the, I don't want to play with this. This is not, you know, to him fighting in, in terms of martial arts and sport, that was kind of fun. It was challenging, you know, but he viewed it as, as a, an activity he could do and, and enjoy. It, real violence was not an enjoyable thing. It was, I, I have a job to do. I've got to, I've got to secure a place or people or, uh, you know, location, whatever. Uh, and I'm not messing around. I'm not going to play. I'm not going to, you know, that's, that's not a place for me to showcase my, you know, incredible techniques or, or anything like that. It was, I got to protect myself, number one, and others, number two, and and that's it. And sometimes those are not in that order. Sometimes you have to perhaps even give up a bit of yourself or your safety, just jeopardize your own safety to protect other people. And and that's what I res respect about anybody that, that deals with violence profession, because that's kind of, they're there as protectors. Um, and one thing I did want to notice, and this is something that, that I kind of, that occurred to me as I started studying more and more videos of, of real fights and, and comparing them to sport fighting and even with sport fighters who get into fights that's not in the ring. And this is where I noticed kind of the, the most distinct difference. And that is that when people get in an adrenalized state and most real fights, and there are exceptions, but most of them have fighters or whoever the aggressor is gets into to some kind of an adrenalized state. They get really excited, really angry. They're not fighting with precision anymore. It's almost gone out the window. They become a flying, swinging fist, flurry mess. It's just, and you never see anything like that in a, in a sport fight. Um, and the exception would be when I've seen in, uh, you know, when they have pre-fight, uh, what do they call them? The, uh, the, 
the PR thing where they bring the sport fighters out and they put them at a table and they do interviews and they, they start puffing up at each other. And sometimes they'll get into fisticuffs there. And I've noticed even the highest level trained boxers start looking like gorillas when they just start flailing their hands and it just turned, they turn into exactly what you see in a, in a surveillance video from, from a street attack it, it, or a, a brawl. It, they, they're just brawlers. Um, have you noticed that same thing too? Oh yeah. I mean, uh, you can have people that's been training for a good amount of time. They have the best balance and, uh, good control of their emotions and situation comes on and they get pushed from the side. Another one tries to hit him with a bottle and it's just complete chaotic. And now it's just push forward and try to get the hits in and, and stand tall, uh, you know, at the end of the situation. So I've seen that several times. Yeah. And it's the very same person. It's like, like, the, it's not like they don't have this. They just don't use it. They turn, they get this rage and they just start going like going crazy. And, and here's another, I, I think kind of a almost myth situation to say that and I've heard this all the time. Well, you know, if you're training for real violence, you're really not training to face a skilled fighter, which is kind of true because most skilled fighters have got, at least got some temperaments and they're, they're, they're not out getting in, start, they're not out starting real fights. But I think it's not so much the fact that somebody who's trained refuses to get into a fight, but it actually changes the person. That's kind of what we're talking about. Even somebody who has skill, their rage and anger can suddenly just wipe a lot of that skill out and they become just this flailing berserker. Um, and I think that yeah. one of the myths is that, that that's not dangerous. Like that's easy to deal with. It's not dealing with somebody who's in a, in a berserk rage is not, is no picnic, even though he is not precise and, you know, controls tempo and, you know, makes it, makes it cal calculating fight when fights are slower, they're a little easier to break down. But when somebody just starts going, like turns into a, a tornado of fists, that's, that can overwhelm even a very skilled fighter. Wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And that, that's like, the, um, you know, that's the part of the, the physical conflict that you don't want to reach if you're working uh, security or you, you want to end it way before that, that part of the conflict uh, uh, happens. So, and it's when it comes to that point and everything's just chaotic and people are just nuts. One guy's maybe is off, you know, on some uh, amphetamines or he, he's, you know, just had a really, really bad day and his girlfriend broke up and he's going uh, nuts you know anything that he finds along the way maybe a bottle maybe he doesn't when he clears up mentally maybe he didn't mean to do everything that he did uh if he has perhaps not the best control of his emotions at the same time he hurts somebody uh, he cuts somebody uh he throws someone to the ground and they hit their the back of their head in, in the pavement and, and now you have a complete different situation Mm -hmm. um and and yeah it's completely different well and you know one of the things we often and i remember you know in the, the dojo training that i've done not just with aikido but with many other arts you see an almost similar pattern where you see a an attack and they say oh, okay we're going to start with a you know punch to the face and it's it's a very sterile direct um disciplined attack probably done slowly because that's where you start, right? But oftentimes the pattern is we practice against rather precise attacks. We can see them very clearly. Usually most dojos are very well lit. Um, it's very easy to identify one particular line of attack. And like we were talking that's earlier, cool. it starts getting dark. You, you maybe have, there's lights around like a club or who knows what's happening around you. It's hard to see. Um, the defenses that we train in that well-lit, kind of sterile environment be, start to become more precise in fact you know a lot of instructors are will harp on their students to be your your deflections need to be very precise and clean and tight and that kind of assumes you can see them and identify them coming and what at least what i've noticed is a lot of the deflections and a lot of the way that that martial artists handle these attacks can leave head and head open they can leave other targets open they can easily miss uh, a a line of attack maybe that they underestimated or, or mistook, even when it's well lit, then you start turning the lights down and try to do those same precise responses to the, those precise attacks 
and everything just goes to hell. Like you, you got people missing and suddenly the Nages are like, they start getting scared and they start behaving instinctually. Like they can't identify that, that attack very easily or use a precise deflection because it's not easy to see it coming, not easy to read somebody. Um, and oh, that's a good point. It, in a situation like that, it's really hard to identify. Yeah. You, you won't see a big punch coming overhand and you do a nice circular movement to that. Uh, yep. Anything goes. And, and sometimes it's just about covering your head and just mm -hmm. committing when you first go in. And it's really, really hard not to do any damage on someone going frantic. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're working as uh, someone who needs to control him, uh, you want to put, uh, you know, control him with uh, as le uh, the least damage as possible. Mm -hmm. But it's really, really hard. If, if it is. The guy is frantic. Uh, bottles are flying. Everything's flying. And the guy is screaming. He's nuts. His eyes are just popping out of his skull. Mm -hmm. And he's coming, you know, at you like he's trying to kill you. And, um, and you're supposed to control him. And then, you know, uh, going, you know, you have to commit and you have to train for that. You know, tunnel vision might kick in for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, your emotions, your your mental, your psych. Uh, you know, have you de dealt with situations like that before? When people are coming at you like that, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. So everything of your of your mentality to your the way you've trained your body and your mind, hundred percent your mind. But you also you have to have the the physical endurance when it goes off because mm. it's exhausting. Um, even though it lasts for maybe 30 seconds or one minute, it's going to really put you to the test. Uh, in, yeah, in I've always. seen 10 seconds of, of adrenaline on somebody exhaust them for days. Like they, th they, they will say, I felt like I ran a marathon. Yeah. Their body's sore and, and whatnot and, and drained for, for 48 hours up, you know, up to even yeah. 72. Um, but yeah, and I want to, years ago, once, you know, it was probably even 15 years ago now, I was first exposed to kind of the combative styles of using head covers and things like that when that sort of fury gets unleashed on you. And I, I thought this was one of the most valuable things that anybody could learn. Any martial artist should know how to, should know how to do it and understand just how valuable it is and in what, what reference frame it, it, it is. And I think that, that, uh, you know, in when I lead my own students through it, one is I've gotten some great comments of, wow, I feel I feel safe. If I tuck my head up and cover up, even if I somebody does get a swing in, I feel kind of secure back there, like I'm not going to get nailed. But I also impress on them the importance of that is if you do get nailed, you can get knocked cold in one shot. Like all the skill that you have will mean nothing when you're trying to remember your name while you're lying on the ground you know you're, you're done it's over so that's a good point you know uh so that's number one is is to is to make sure the sensitive parts don't get nailed and, and knock you out and then to to be able to intercede with the flurry and that's the flurry is not just the 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 line of the punches coming in it's the body that's hurling in towards you you can you can have cover yourself against those those shots and still get tackled or run over by just somebody who like a steamroller, they just charge over you. Um, so, you know, because I remember one of the first things I, I learned in, in Aikido the first day was, you know, get off the line, absolutely get off the line. Well, what I realized there can be multiple lines, two or three lines you have to get off at the same time. And yeah. when we do too much of the precise, you know, non-intrusive attack where somebody steps, you know, a foot away from you and then swings and their body stops and all you have to worry about is the arm. We're leaving out the body part, you know, the tackle. And, uh, and so I, I personally, I think it's important to eventually introduce all of that because you can't just deal with one and ignore the other, especially as I watched those videos that had so many tackles, so much, it looked like puppies playing and tumbling around over tables and chairs. And I mean, it, it's uh, pure chaos, you know, and you, uh, to me, it's like, you look at that and say, well, I suppose it's almost testament to how many fights end up on the ground. But, you know, usually it's because there's no, there's a complete lack of footwork or, or what looked like skill of staying on your feet, which to me is a testament of that's why you want to train. You want to train not to get knocked over, you know, by some lunatic. Um, 
yeah. want to be on your feet, not be on the ground. Yeah, and when, like you said, when you if you get clocked, like uh, especially if you haven't been before, mm -hmm. uh, the the reaction you get is 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 a little bit uh, depends on uh, how many times you've been hit and also your training. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gonna really test you, like completely different when you know the UK is coming coming with a with a strike and you step off the line and then in another situation we're out there and someone just clocks you from the side or you, you hit the ground and then you get up again is is a completely different feeling yep. and now it's chaotic adrenaline is pumping uh and your eyes you know you're just looking for that one guy and what well, there might be more and uh so <clears throat> um when we train we usually we, we start with training the basics of fighting and we usually train with uh, you have to know how to strike and cover. Uh, we don't do a lot of head movements. Uh, obviously, you got to do a little bit of that. But we mostly focus on covering the head. Like if there's several people, then somebody punches from the side. You still got the head covered. Mm -hmm. uh, balance. Uh, when they lower their body position, uh, you know how to follow that. You know, if they come for a takedown, uh, you want to always stay on the outside. It's not always that easy. You know, keep your back clean. Uh, make sure nobody's running up from the side and, and, you know, you train and you try to eliminate all of these possibilities that might occur, but you can't eliminate all of them with training. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you always have to stay, stay aware, stay awake, be humble, never become arrogant and think that I've trained for 20 years. I can handle any situation mm -hmm. because I've also seen that, you know, with some people that's trained for a lot of years, they're good fighters and stuff. And then. Some guy just comes up, hits them perfectly on the chin, um, and um, they go down. And Good night. So, yeah. yeah. You know, I, that kind of bring, that brings up something I, that I very much believe in, and that is a, training needs to in, include a bit of a hardening to it. Because um, you mentioned it with people that have never taken a shot before where you imagine what it's like and then it really happens and you, you you just your brain goes into this what on earth was that and you it takes way too long for you to process it at that moment and i remember a story and I, henry rollins talked about this i saw it on one of his his little performances and he said yeah when i was in high school you know i was a skinny kid i was getting bit, bullied and picked on and you know i didn't really have a dad to, to look up to or to go to, but he said, my science teacher, I think it was a science, either science or math teacher, I think science, you know, he was, he was a weightlifter and boxer. And so he went to, Henry went to him and said, you know, Hey, can you show me how this goes and stuff? And he kind of looked up to him as like a father figure. And so one of the things that, that this guy did, he talked about the bullying and about, you know, okay, well, how do, how would I prepare if somebody was going to pick on me or get in a fight? And he said, all right, well, we're going to, we're going to harden you up. We're going to harden you up some. And he's like, well, what, you know, what are you going to do? But he, he didn't tell him. And so they're walking down the hall and Henry passes by the teacher and the teacher just lays one right in his, right in his stomach, just boom, fist right. And he says, it doubled me over. Like, oh, I couldn't believe it. And he just kept walking. And, uh, you know, so he said, I'd, I'd go, you know, lift my weights and stuff. And I was still skinny, but I was getting a little stronger. And, you know, a day or two later, same thing happened. And he's like, oh, okay, that hurt. And he said, within two weeks or three weeks, he'd walk by and bam, he'd hit me in the stomach and you just look at him and walk right on by. You get used to what that contact is like if you do that. And it wasn't entirely because he was lifting weights and his muscles were getting bigger. There was a mental hardening as well as a physical hardening that went with it. And I've seen old school uh, martial art instructors, you know, decades ago that would, as their students were doing katas, they'd come along with sticks and they'd hit him in the gut or they'd hit him on the leg or, you know, those were meant to harden the muscle, but I think it was also to harden the mind to just say, I can get hit and it's not a big deal. 100%. A huge part. Yeah. Good. good. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, and that's what you also, when you do uh, like tactical training and stuff like that, you stress train, mm -hmm. uh, you go through uh, physical pain, everything to train the, the mental and the spirits. Mm -hmm. And um, um, like, it, it's, it's a lot of love in it at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like I, I have a few examples. I don't know if I could mention like a couple of them, but, um, but yeah, it, they're training resilience, mental resilience, and then training the spirit. Uh, I think a lot of that comes from the dojo also, but it comes from whatever you in, uh, encounter in life, how you deal with it. If you become conscious of how you want to deal with problems and pain, 
and you, you you know how to deal with it in in order to uh, overcome the the ups and downs in life, and you can become strong, you know. Um, and I think um, I think that's very very important. And you look in today's society; it's a lot of talk about. Of course, we can talk about emotions and we can talk about everything, but I think to overcome a lot of the problems that a lot of young kids at least deal with, you have to become resilient. You know, don't become low energy slash depressed because you didn't get enough likes, because because you don't get enough acceptance at school. Uh, you know, become mentally strong, and then your your physical body will follow afterwards. And I, I've had colleagues that's really like physically short and small, but some of the toughest colleagues that I've had in situations where we've had like several guys standing waiting for us. And it's never about the size. Obviously, size plays a mattering form, so force versus force. But when it comes to just heart and spirit, it's um, size doesn't have that much to say. Um, and um, resilience, like you said, and it's a lot of love and toughening up people, you know. Mm -hmm. And I've, some of the training that I went through, uh, they beat the shit out of me. Mm -hmm. But I, I fucking love those guys, and I think that was awesome. And uh, I felt awesome afterwards. It sucked during the whole training, but it's, I mean, well, you just, you just understand. Where, you know, you, you don't want to get into sadism or masochism, you know, where you're just yeah. on each other pointlessly. But to understand where your limits are, understand that you can take a shot and, and not have it end you. And also realize that even though you do get toughened, you do understand where your weaknesses are. Like, the toughest guy on the planet can get hit on the jaw just right and it'll be lights oh, 100%. out. And so it, it's not like you're you're doing this type of training to become uh, impervious or invincible. You won't. You will never get that. It but, humbles you also. Yeah, you'll get to you the also. point where you realize, boy, if somebody's going to take me down, they're going to they're gonna have a tough time doing it. And I'm not going to yeah. you know, be made out of glass. And, and the minute I take one little shot, I'm going to be crumpled because there are people like that. And, you, and like, you respect also, yeah, you it's respect a, them, uh, violence afterwards. You yeah. respect it, and you you you, you don't want to go through it, and you become humble. Yeah. Now, a lot of people are not humble because they just haven't. They've been training maybe uh, in the dojo a very long time, and they, they grow this arrogance, and it's uh, arrogance is never good. No, arrogance is never ever good. So, um, especially in, in 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 dangerous situations. You know, and one of the things uh, kind of a, in parallel to this, the way that I it feels to me that, that my and you could say maybe this is a duty. It, it's a duty for me as an instructor. It's a me as it's a duty to me as a representative of my, my martial art. Almost like I was a personal trainer. And if you came to me and maybe you were 15 years old and scrawny and skinny and you know, we put you on a bench and you say, well, today you can only bench press like 40 pounds. And you're, you're like, OK, well, yeah, I, I get it. I'm weak, but I'm going to start and I'm going to get going. Imagine you were coming to me for five years and you walked in the door and we never, we never did any more than 40 pounds. You'd be wondering what, why am I not any more capable now than I, five years from now than I was when I walked in here. To me, the duty is that just like that, that personal trainer would be obligated to make sure that there was progress. You know, in a year, you should be able to bench press 125 pounds. And then, you know, another year, maybe you're up to 180 or, you know, you're getting stronger, you're getting more capable. And I think that, you know, I know with my students, I want them to be able to handle tougher and tougher situations with more variables that they ha can handle and deal with. Um, you know, even, you know, on my first belt test now, I have one of the criteria that I have for yell belts is they have to be held on the ground by somebody bigger than them. And they got to be able to get back up, even though that person's trying to hold them down on the ground. And you know, originally when I started getting into the grappling thing, I was like, boy, can I even do that? And, in, in, you know, within six months, in addition to all the other stuff we're training and I found it, it's easy to do. It's not that it's pretty straightforward. In fact, I just had a couple of teenage teenagers or a daughter or one of my students that daughters that came in with him, they started long after he did, but you know, they got old enough and they did it successfully very easily. And, um, I think that the same thing applies to uh, working on people flailing at you or, or ambushing you or trying to tackle you or holding you on the ground. All of that stuff, to me, encapsulates what it's like to protect yourself. And I think 
um, when I relate it to Aikido, harmonizing with the universe or harmonizing with energy is to is part of that is protecting yourself from it. If you are getting overrun by nature, you are not in harmony at all. You are in direct conflict and and losing. And so a part of that is being able to turn something that would be a direct threat, whether it's a boulder rolling down a hill and you get off the line. Now you're protecting yourself from an external threat. 100%. And uh, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, most personal growth comes from suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, to the point where you can get up and ahead in life, but um, mm -hmm. being comfortable in life is, is never too good, especially not for too long. Right. I think suffering during training is, is, is good. Mm -hmm. it, it creates uh, room for humility, for being humble, for gaining wisdom, for gaining personal wisdom and growth. And also speaking of the spiritualism and the spiritual side of Aikido, I think that um, fear is one of the, the main blockages of developing uh, your spiritual side. And if you stay yeah. passive throughout your whole life, um, sure, you'll probably do a good yoga hour and preach a good uh, way to breathe. But mm -hmm. um, to really understand uh, your own potential and consciousness and the, the things that's um, going on, uh, you need to really be testing yourself as life is always testing us. Mm -hmm. So we either learn or we don't learn from it. Everything can't is stay a test. passive. Everything is a test. And through the cycles, uh, that we go through, we either repeat them or we, we step up our, uh, another notch. And I think that um, staying passive is, is is never good. You know, staying passive is um, well, um, neither yes or no. Mm -hmm. You know, staying passive is all right. Choose your battles. You choose your battles. Uh, this one is not for me. This is nothing to gain from. The best fight to win is the one you don't have to fight, actually fight. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes you have to make a decision and what's right and what's not right um what's what's better and more profitable uh for the good picture mm -hmm. and and stand your ground for it regardless what society might say in forms of norms or in forms of whatever you know what's right is right regardless and elevating your consciousness sorry i'm going off here elevating oh, your consciousness good. is really breaking with fear breaking with all of these negative um emotions that a lot of people hold on to and suppressing mm -hmm. emotions and and all of this stuff is just becoming a better version of yourself. And really, that's uh, what I think martial arts initially is supposed to do. It's not only breaking boards and, and doing katas and, and uh, that stuff. You know, that's supposed to elevate you as a human as well. Mm -hmm. I cursed in the previous uh, question. Sorry for that. Oh, that's all right. Um, in fact, I think a word that definitely applies here is confidence. And one of the things that I've noticed... Uh, in every student that really enjoys their martial art training, they enjoy the confidence of knowing that they can handle what they could not handle when they when they started. Uh, whether that's somebody grabbing them, trying to gra uh, tackle them, or choke them, or punch them, or whatever, they they have a, a level of confidence. And and I shared this in the forum about a month ago. I got a call from a, a former student of mine years uh, that she was training with me years ago, and she's an older gal and. And she had somebody grab her by the throat, two hands around her throat. And she's like, I don't even know what I did, but you showed me something in one of the last classes we were in on how to get out of it. And I got right out of it. Like I wasn't choked out. And th this was a 61 year old woman and she works in a, like a halfway house for homeless people. So she's dealing with people that are on drugs and kind of erratic and things like that. But she was, she was exuberant. Like I, that was amazing. I, I, it was one second and I was gone and, and out. And she loved the confidence that that, that had. And, um, you know, granted, she only was with me for a couple of months. But, uh, you know, and then she said, well, I, I got to come back because I had somebody else grab a pen and they started stabbing at me. I didn't even know what to do. And I think, well, you know, you can always learn more. There's there's not like a, a finite size of that bucket to fill of your of your confidence and your capabilities. And when it comes oh, down I'm to mattering, sure. it can be everything. You know, fortunately, she was not stabbed. Oh, yeah. You know, the person was was uh, dealt with. But um, but I think that confidence is is a whole uh, probably one of the greatest things that you can get from that martial art training, as long as it's done correctly. So you're not just playing around in you know with like pool noodles and 
and then expecting when you got to do something for real that it's going to work it needs to be have that that level of of uh integrity i guess would be a good word to use for it yeah that's a good word yeah uh, that the stuff works and it's not parlor tricks it's not just seeing a good compelling you know performance by choreographed you know performers it's getting to the reality of what what can really work and and uh you know the simple direct powerful things that i think are at the core of all martial art training and um yeah, it's it's to me it was great to get that call, but also to have it as that reality check of, you know, you can in a very short time you can get something that can really help you out when things go sideways. Oh yeah, and and, and your your brain is like a, a computer storage almost. Like you train, uh, and it, it stores in there. Like some people they study for a math test, they think they don't know anything. They come to the math test, and suddenly they remember. Yep. Um, but, but you mentioned a good thing, which is integrity in training. That's why I think that people like yourself, you know, you focus on, on, on integrity and reality and, uh, and the true, um, aspects of martial arts, which is you're training something that, um, is in, uh, accordance with reality. So if you do happen to come in a situation, you've actually trained something that kicks in in the muscle memory and the subconscious and, and you can actually pull it off. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think a lot of people, they become disappointed because they've been rolling around doing mumbo jumbo for, I don't know how long, but they never really, they never really like, like I, I, I don't understand it. Like everyone's seen a fight on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. And you see how people fight and stuff like that. If people haven't fought themselves, at least they've, they've seen how it goes down. And if you're going to train, uh, if you're going to do a bike ride, you don't train skateboarding. Right. So, uh, I mean, if you're going to swim, you don't yeah. just crawl into your bathtub. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you won't learn swimming from the bathtub. You know, and I'm glad you brought this up because I've had a couple of students express this, like, how am I going to remember all this stuff? They'll get done with a class and usually their brain is full and they're trying to process what, the, what I've showed them. And they're like, how am I going to remember all this when I'm suddenly under, under a stress? And I said, don't worry about it. I'm not training your brain. I'm training your body to, to feel and respond to that feel when it happens and when she called me and said i don't even i said because i asked her i said well what what did you do she said i don't remember i don't have no idea what it was i'm like well there you go the body was trained with a pattern for how to respond and it did it just executed it yeah. the way it needed to yeah and also during training uh, another good thing is um being able to let go mm -hmm. uh, let go of all forms of fear forms of ego forms of uh there's no time to analyze uh, when it's um, chaotic. So being able to move, letting go, and then move. Uh, you just let whatever you've trained on and your spirit and your, your whole body mechanisms uh, do its part. Yeah, when the, the fundamental principles are, are good and they've been trained and are honed, you can trust them. You don't have to. You're not second-guessing yourself as you're watching. I think that's what Musashi was talking about with, when he referred to the void. Uh, it's very hard to break down and analyze what he's talking about. But to me, it's when you have no distractions in your mind and you're just doing, you're acting as you have trained and your body's just doing it. And you're not, there's your conscious mind's not in the way. Yeah. To me, that's, that's how I, I read it. It could be, you know, there's probably many other interpretations of it, but, uh, and he, as a yeah. sport fighter, I felt that a few times, but it is hard to get there. It, it's oh, yeah. it's almost like trying to grab smoke out of the air. You can you can grab all you want, but you're you know it's it's very elusive. <laughs> yeah, it, it's um it's it, it, that's a very high state of uh level of martial artists mm -hmm. level. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> you, you can't really always tap into it, but mm -hmm. uh, you know you yeah. train for it. it, it it's <laughs> a great goal to to strive for for sure. Um, and one of the things I wanted to cover in this discussion, just to jump a little bit with uh, with the idea of there's no rules versus having rules. For one thing, I do think that all martial art training on a dojo mat has got rules, no matter what some instructor says. Where say, well, we're not, we're not, we don't, our art doesn't doesn't worry about rules or restrictions. And because I've heard even Aikido 
people will say this is Aikido doesn't, it doesn't have the rules like a sport fight would have, but we, there are rules. You cannot train with zero rules and no mind for safety. Like you just can't, otherwise everybody's going to get hurt and it's going to be just a, like a Conan blood pit. Um, but oftentimes it's the rules are the, well, we train for the, the implication is we are our trains for fighting dirty. So we can handle the stuff that is illegal, like, going groin grabbing or hair pulling or eye jabbing or all this most all the stuff that is illegal in in sport fighting which i find kind of ironic because i've seen very little aikido that is focused on that kind of dirty fighting there are many vulnerabilities that i've noticed and have tried to mitigate as much as possible applying technique and trying to shut down as many of those opportunities for dirty fighting as as possible and it, ch it changes the techniques some when you start seeing those vulnerabilities. And in my mind, it, the reason that they exist is, again, practice became a little too sterile, a little too clean and precise. And uh, it's easy to over, th therefore overlook, all right, what happens when things just get messy? Like you've got somebody flailing around, they'll grab whatever they can grab, a pant leg or a belt or who knows what. Um, you know, I, I haven't seen too many Aikidoists trained for like what happens when your pant leg gets grabbed or what, ha what happens when somebody grabs, you know, the back of your jacket or something like that, you know. Uh, I think those are important because that's the sort of crazy nonsense that happens in, in real fights. People grab anything and get a hold of and who knows what. It's, it's hard to, fighting is so chaotic. It is hard to, to cleanly classify everything to organize it into curriculum and yeah, that's, that's why that's i like basically being a principle-based instructor because it's impossible to kind of do it otherwise and, and cover a lot of those bases yeah i mean, I mean a lot of aikido people i think they, they lack accountability mm -hmm. uh and they kind of like they put that on the sensei or the instructor and they're like yeah well he knows how to do this and he wouldn't just chop you in the back of the head and you'd be finished in one second. Right. Um, and and um, I haven't really, I've heard Aikido people say, you know, Aikido is not for sport fighting and it's uh, one cut, one life and all of this stuff. Uh, but um, first you need to understand basic fighting though before you can start talking about high level mm -hmm. martial arts stuff. So right. um, um, accountability is very important and like the chaos like we've spoken of a few times here is <clears throat> um you get pushed from the side you fall down maybe and you 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 won't break the fall as you do in the dojo maybe you break a couple of your fingers on the way down mm -hmm. then you get up again and your hand is weird maybe you don't feel it that much in the moment right but now it's a completely different scenario you mm -hmm. can't really protect anything that's coming forward except for an attacker uh it will not be organized um hands is you know you won't have time to look at hands hands going for weapons um how emotional are you in that moment obviously aggression uh is is an emotion you can use you just go full aggression in but it's never good to be emotional in situations you want to be as motion as possible which is back to what we just mentioned Mm -hmm. uh, which is flowing at a high level, whereas you, you're proactive and rather than reacting to stuff, you're just flowing with it, making the attackers come the way you want them to come. Mm -hmm. And um, works perfectly if you uh, uh, envision it or you've seen it in the movies. But sometimes reality just is a little bit uh, more challenging than that. So um, how, how much in center can you stay in those situations? You can train stress training in the dojo and really push it, push it to the to the to the moment where you barely can breathe uh, and you still have people coming at you. And maybe you receive a strike in the guts or a low kick or a punch to the face and you're still going. You keep pushing those boundaries and you're training your center eventually and your spirits. And that's really what's going to carry you because um, you get clocked. And you go down, or it really, you know, makes you dizzy for a moment. That's when your extra gear has to kick in. And if you never really train for that extra gear and that extra gear after that, if you never understood that it's all a mental game, 
and, and the body will follow, um, you will have a very hard time if you're in your emotions after you get hit once. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's good to be punched a couple of times. You know, it's, it's it really good for you. It's, uh, it humbles you and um, to know makes what you respect like. violence. Exactly. You know what it's like, and it makes you respect violence. It makes you respect, I don't know, respect your attacker, but respect that uh, you're, uh, you know. Well, I, I, to you me, it's gotta like, put, like put on a fight. Nature. If you if you go charging out to, you know, walk the mountainside, and but you don't realize that there are mountain lions out there. There might be rattlesnakes. There might be things that are dangerous, and you just carelessly go walking through there. You might run across something that could end you. But you respect those things. You you watch for signs that they're there. You you know you like we were talking about earlier with the situational awareness. You're not going to look to confront one of them. You know to avoid them. But not, you need to understand kind of what the the environment you're going into. And this is where yeah. one of those uh, things. And, and I think Mark McYoung talked about this. He's one of my one of my sources, one of my favorite sources for real world violence and kind of to try to understand it better because it's easy to try to mischaracterize uh, violence or to try to narrow it down to you know, everybody's been guilty of this. Like it's like a mugging or it's like a bar fight or, you know, fill in the blank of this is what all violence is represented by this type of a, of a conflict. And that's just not true. Um, and if I remember right, he talked about some several different types of violence that can happen. It's not just somebody pulls a knife on you because they want your wallet. That can happen. Uh, it can be, you know, whether it's planned out, it could be a predator that's that's looking to score money or looking to score maybe kidnapping, who knows, all the way up. Or to just hurt you. Yeah, or they just want to hurt you. It could be one of opportunity. Somebody gets drunk. They just, they're angry. They've had a, the worst day. They just want to take it out on somebody and you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and it could also be social. Like you did something that you didn't even know was wrong and somebody steps up to correct you and they need to set you straight. And this does not happen among suburban, suburbanite type people and, you know, that type of folks. This is more in communities that ha have harder lines but drawn between uh, people's property and what is theirs and what they view as theirs. Um, and sometimes violence is the way that they establish their boundaries. And that might just be cuffing, you know, slapping you in the face or cuffing you on the side of the head. You know, it could be just a 10 second beat down just to make sure you get the point. Don't mess with me. Don't mess with my stuff. Don't mess with my friends or my family. You know, these things can happen that way. And just because you never read the, read the signs, you know, you didn't hear the, the mountain lion growling didn't mean that you didn't walk into a territory that you shouldn't have been in. Um, exactly. And, and sometimes it's it's it would be easy to, to feel a little too entitled to say, well, I, I'm not causing any trouble. I should be able to do what I want, say what I want or look at who I want or, you know, you can just realize there can be a, a cost for doing what you're doing. And you may not oh, yeah. know that you're crossing somebody else's boundary. And that can be, yeah. that can be dangerous. I mean, these are weird different ways that violence can happen. That is sometimes seems like it came out of nowhere to the poor victim, but a lot of times it didn't come out of nowhere. If they were, weren't oblivious, they probably would have noticed that trouble yeah. was headed their way. Yeah, I mean, I've seen also like people just walking down with their girlfriend and some people walk past and <clears throat> they look at them weird mm -hmm. and they just get struck and they have no idea. What did I do? And they're in shock. Mm -hmm. I also seen like videos of people pushing other people in front of trains completely unprovoked. Yeah. And how do you explain that logically, it's, rationally? How do you explain that? It's, it's crazy. Back to the predator uh, thing that you were talking about mm -hmm. and um someone might feel disrespected disrespected someone might just be crazy you know in certain parts of the world the, the violence and uh uh people are poor people are desperate you might look like someone that uh, might have something another person wants yeah. um and yeah being blind to reality and being entitled thinking that your emotions and whatever you you're a good person nobody's gonna hurt you mm -hmm. sometimes life especially predators don't give a 
don't care about that. Yep. You're just there, and, and uh, you happen to be on his food plate at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you know you you know what to do with it, and yep. you know how to avoid it. If you can't avoid it, you know how to deal with it. If you have the right mindset, maybe sometimes people will see, okay, there's a confident person. I'm going to choose another victim. Uh, sometimes that's not even the point. It, it could go past that as well. Um, so, yeah. You know, one of the one of the most remarkable, I kind of refer to this as a mental video. When I was younger, I, I did security at this, uh, this bar had sort of a festival kind of event set up and, and uh, I was helping on the security crew there and I was on the door and after they let out, they sort of let out onto the street and the, the city had blocked off the street. So there were people wandering around, you know, people everywhere. And it's, you know, 12, 30, one o'clock in the morning. And there was, uh, it was shoulder to shoulder outside the door. Cause if people leave, they kind of just loiter around. They don't go out right to their cars. They just sort of hang out. And there was this group of people and it was like 10 or 12 people all circled in facing each other. I'm sure you've seen this a million times. And this, these two guys walk out and they walk by this circle. And within the circle, there was this, and I was not even five feet from this, but I, all I could see was heads and shoulders because it was so packed. And I hear this woman go, that guy just grabbed my ass. And the guy next to her turns around and he just launches at this guy who was walking by. Now, I couldn't tell whether he grabbed her or not. I didn't know if it was him that grabbed her, if somebody did grab her, or if she just said that. I don't have no idea. But what I saw was this attacker suddenly airborne with his fist loaded up, and this guy turns around, and they were suddenly on the ground in a matter of, it was less than a second and a half. And, yeah, you know, I would have a hard time. I wouldn't think that somebody, this guy was probably just an innocent dude, and maybe it was somebody else's hand, and he wound up being the first target. But as far as I could tell, he was, you know, just peaceful guy. He and his buddy were going to their car and, and suddenly it was, you know, he was up on a, against a fence being held down and beaten. But by the time we got there was, you know, still three, four seconds by the time we could get through the crowd. But, you know, you could argue, well, yeah, you shouldn't be at a bar at 1230 in the morning because, you know, stuff like that could happen. But just the idea that you are acting peacefully will protect you. It will mostly protect you if you're not in instigating fights, but it doesn't mean you're not in the wrong place at the wrong time and how fast it can happen, you know, um, and everybody that I, I talked to, yeah. even the more experienced people when I was working, they're like, I see that every weekend, you know, that's, that's, that's not even unusual, you know, yeah. and, and th th then they would tell me, it's like, we've also seen women that'll come in and actually want, they'll pick fights for their boyfriend. You know, oh, yeah. mouth will start going off and they'll get into it with some guy and then they'll drag the boyfriend into it or, you know, something like that. It's like you wouldn't believe they said it to the time like you wouldn't believe all the crazy things that happen when people get together and, you know, and and drink or not. It, but there are some people out there crazy. They don't need alcohol to be crazy. Um, oh, yeah. And it's, know, it's, there are it's weird people that yeah. want to see people fight and they'll go start start up stirring things up to to get yeah. entertainment um it, it's very very dangerous to uh react in situations like that without thinking and Absolutely. usually what people do in, in social experiments like uh, the nightlife mm -hmm. is they're very instinctive uh they don't think much they might regret the day after if you turn around and you just punch that guy you have no idea how many people he's with. You don't know if he has weapons. You don't know anything, actually. Um, so before you, your girlfriend goes, oh, my God, he, he this guy just pinched my butt. And then you turn around, you clock him. And then suddenly uh, you're in a completely different scenario than what you vision in your head that moment. So you thought maybe I'm just going to get him back and I'll look cool in front of my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Now you have a whole bunch of guys that's going to uh, pummel you. Yep. And stuff like this happen, and sometimes it, it really turns bad. Uh, people get injured for life. You know, a street fight can be very dangerous. You can get a finger in your eye. You can break something. You can get paralyzed. Uh, you can hit your head in, in, in certain points where, you know, you get brain damage. Mm -hmm. um, reacting without thinking something I've seen too much of in the nightlife and usually that's what people do against bouncers is just 
Mm -hmm. You don't let them in or they feel disrespected or they every psychological baggage they have from the rest of their, you know, their previous life. Uh, they bring on to that situation and it's your fault. And um, they just don't know what they're doing. And a lot of times in life, people don't know what they're doing. That's also something you have to think about that when you're doing a, a tactical uh, measurement of a situation, you know, this guy might be, he might pull a, you know, he might be carrying a knife, not because he wants to kill someone, but he wants to impress his buddies or whatever. Uh, he wants to, you know, be a part of the crew. Mm -hmm. A lot of young kids got knives today. Oh, yeah. They got guns too. Mm -hmm. But they got they got weapons and they don't know the, the responsibility that comes with it because if you pull that, it's a lethal situation. And if you use it, you might end up going to jail for a long time or you might lose it and someone using it against you. Mm -hmm. um, and these people that shoot, uh, they're young and... They get heated for a moment. They pull the gun. They shoot someone. Now they go to jail for a long time. And obviously, they're going to regret it. But people's minds are not very in balance uh, under drugs, under psychological illnesses, uh, you know, mental illnesses, under certain circumstances. Just today's society is a little bit different. Uh, I'm sure, there was a lot of violence before, and it was it will always be amongst humans. But today it's just very chaotic because there's a lot of problems in society and it just seems to be growing. Mm -hmm. uh, the differences between people become bigger. Uh, mental illness is even bigger than before. Uh, weapons is more available than ever. It doesn't matter how much you ban it. The right, the, you know, the, the, the people will find the people that want it will find it. Um, and protecting yourself just becomes more and more important. But do realize that a street fight can be very, very dangerous. So you need to understand. The dangers of it, the dangers of violence, uh, you have to respect violence, uh, you have to grow as a human, you know, sometimes you need to be the bigger person, you know, you don't have to retaliate at all times. Uh, and if you do retaliate, you need to understand the consequences of it and be able to deal with that. Yeah, you know, Whether I've it's legal, had a couple of physical law, law enforcement or, uh, officer friends of mine that will have told me that it's, it's very typical, at least here in our area, that... Um, Somebody who will start a fight could be armed, but they will not necessarily draw the weapon out right away. They'll only do it if they're yeah. losing. So just because yeah. you get into something with somebody and you see their hands are empty doesn't mean that there may not be a weapon emerge in, you know, 10 seconds or 20 seconds or, you know, sometime mid fight when they realize things aren't going as well as they believe. And yeah. I think regardless of, of how irrational somebody might be, I think that somebody who's going to start a fight usually will think I'm going to start this because I've got an ace in the hole. I'm confident I'm going to win. And not just because they've got skill, but they want, they are either got friends, they got access to a weapon or some kind of a surprise in case things don't go the way that they want um, or in their, you know, in their favor. Um, and, and that was kind of been confirmed by at least people I train with that have dealt with, with violent people. They're like, yeah, that's kind of how it goes. But like you said, there are, I think, a growing number of totally irrational people out there, whether it's, you know, mental instability or mental problems, some maybe a chemical thing or, a, you know, some kind of medical problem or, you know, they're on pharmaceuticals or something, some kind of chemical distortion. And culture I, as well. And uh, culture which, can be, you know, just yeah, one of them. Could, yeah, it could be just culture. total, yeah, who knows. Um, what I've noticed is when you see people do that, they, like we talked about earlier, they do not attack in a in an orderly or skilled manner. It is just flailing. And you be, maybe be kind of amused, but I've, in dealing with somebody like that, to me, in terms of you get on the mat, You'd like to, I'd like to feel, or I want to have my students feel what it's like to deal with somebody like that. So I have them as okay, like, all right, now you're going to act kind of like a crazy person. You're just going to start flailing away. You start learning. All right. How do you deal with those arms flying around all over the place? How do you handle them when they're, when their body is just spasming or you're, they're going, and it might even be somebody who's having a seizure and you need to control them so they don't hurt themselves. You know, like a, who knows, a, a nurse or a orderly or or even just a normal person because seizures are becoming quite common um 
Oh yeah. Then you might have to help somebody not hurt themselves by just their body flailing. And how do you do it safely? So it's taking Uke and, and all right, let's change the parameters because you're the training partner. You're meant to be the, you know, the, kind of the training dummy. Let's program you to act in a way that we see happen on, in a lot of these real world instances and get used to and build confidence. All right, how do I deal with that? How do I deal with not getting hit? How do I control their body? For you, it should be just taking care of business. You should be confident with that. Um, and it's a fun exercise, whether you start from the ground or you start from standing or you take them to the ground, like, all right, how do you safely get control of this person? Um, but it's outside of that normal sterilized, you know, slow, straight punch or, or sterile grab. You get a lot more variables. And what I noticed is it doesn't take that long to start realizing, okay, this is not that hard to deal with. You just have to cover a few bases don't get clipped by those arms flailing around, you know, um, and use things that, that a lot of Aikido doesn't tend to work with a lot, which I like grabbing the body, body locks. Oh yeah. Yep. In control of, you know, I know most of, of the contemporary Aikido likes to attach to arms. You've got so many arm techniques, which are great, but I find that they can be a little flaky, especially against somebody that's spasming or their arms are flying around. But you go to the body, you can get control of somebody. And it's yeah. very easy, straightforward, reliable, low risk. If you're hugging up on somebody and you body lock them, they really, there's not much they can do to you as, as you take them down. And you can control how hard you take them down too. You don't have to slam yeah. them hard. You know, got good level of control. To me, that's where it fits well into that, like the Aikido framework. What, what is the goal that we're trying to achieve here? And to me, that's control. Yeah, uh, well said. I think a lot of Aikido people they 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 think that uh, having your arms out is is um, a good way to uh, deal with uh, attackers. It, and it's the few seminars um, I don't really go to a lot of seminars uh, recently because I don't want to. But um, <laughs> it's just like when we. Okay, we, if we're dealing with punches, you know, and if you have your arms out, uh, number one, you're leaving your whole face and your body open, mm -hmm. and you won't have time to pull your arms back. And if you don't know the basics of just covering here, and, you know, uh, that's just basic fighting, you know, and it's much easier to go for a bigger body part, like the whole body. Right. You can go in there and grab the body well, arms can move around behind. fast, but bodies move slower they're easier to, to yeah track. it's really hard to get a hold of the hands mm -hmm. plus you don't have a lot of time you know you have very little time also you want to end it as quickly as possible in case of all the uh, variabilities like uh if he gets time to pull a weapon if he gets a punch in uh, if there's more people uh the longer the fight goes on you know the more dangerous it becomes uh because he might amp it up you know he might not want to hurt you as bad in the beginning now he feels even more threatened um and so you want to end it as quickly as possible and going for the body like you said is more effective and easier and you want to do something that you're confident that works mm -hmm. getting a hold of his wrist and making a rocky in the middle of a situation is really hard like you can do it in the beginning of a situation uh, he grabs you, he taps his nuts, maybe you do a Nikki or something. Um, that works. Um, but you shouldn't be chasing techniques. I guess my point is a lot of Aikido people, they try to chase techniques. Mm -hmm. oh, I want to get a Nikki in or I train Nikki and I think that's the best technique. But you can't chase techniques. You just have to flow with it, go for what you know, and, and get control. Um, like you said, control which is essentially what you want to uh, profit off of. The other great benefit I, that I found with closing in with things like body locks is that if there are other things flying around or other people swinging, if you hug in somebody, it protects your head from, the, from a lot of different angles. And we always have to assume, even though you're facing one person, you could have other things going on around you. Or where there wasn't anybody a moment ago, now two seconds later, somebody else shows up and now they want to get into, into things. And there's plenty of videos where there's bystanders in fights and they're just looking and suddenly they see an opportunity to be like, oh yeah, well here, 
and they'll throw a kick in or they'll, yeah. you know, they'll, they'll want to get a little play in there. Um, so it's yeah. that vision part is, is, is a big factor of it too. That, and that's different from a sport fight. You never have to tackle somebody and submit them while you're watching for their friend to show up, you know? So yeah. to me, that's, that's affected my training quite a bit just in not becoming so threat focused on your, on the person you're dealing with that you can see what's going on around you. I think that those and, are, and also you have to attack, right? You no, know, for nothing, you can't be passive. You, mm -hmm. you, you're not supposed yeah, to wait yeah. for someone to attack you. You mm -hmm. have to attack. And some people think that if you keep your arms out, then he's going to feel like, uh, you're going to push the distance. Mm -hmm. And if you bring the arms closer, then, then, uh, he's coming closer. Well, you want him to come anyways, mm -hmm. but you have to come before him. You, know, you can't wait for someone and, and reacting in a situation is, is not good. You have to be proactive. You have to, uh, attack and make the fight. It's usually the, the person that, that, that attacks that, that, uh, well, not every time, but you know, when you're defending yourself. You have to attack. You cannot be standing and waiting. Mm -hmm. and, um, so like keto people learn, learn how to attack. <laughs> Actually, and that brings me to one of the things I want to talk about uh, next to is, and this kind of goes back to what you talked about before, which was, you know, one, uh, one step, one cut, or one, one cut, one life. So the, the quote from a sensei that, and I have to paraphr paraphrase this rather strongly because it's been years since I read it, but he talked about self-defense is step off the line and cut, and that should just end, end the violence, end the fight, it's over while I admire that in terms of a, of a, of an ideal fighting is more difficult when you try to impose that on it. It just doesn't go that way unless Plus you're not carrying a sword. Uh, well, yeah, unless you strike first. And that brings me to the question is Aikido. If you use that kind of concept is Aikido a first strike or an ambush art where you are the one to strike initially and you know we we talk about uh, the timing of the uh sen sen no sen of you intercepting the the that moment between you you read somebody and their intention to attack as they start to move that's when you execute your attack in my opinion that's extremely hard to read uh you can do it but can you count on it I don't know if you can count on it. Obviously, like like Osensei's quote, I think it's like an, an ivory tower ideal. If you could get to the point where you can read somebody so well, you get a feeling for their level of agitation, you get a feeling for when they're about to move and you read it, and that's when you physically intervene on them and you stop them. And I know bouncers do this, so it's not impossible. Uh, but it takes a high level of, of skill, perception, intuition, as well as the physical handling part. Yeah, and when you see, when you get to the point where a person is in your face, um, his eyes is locked on you, um, he's becoming more sincere in his threats, uh, maybe he's silent now, mm -hmm. and you don't wanna be standing there and waiting. So a lot of times you can just push the guy, you know, that's also a mess, you push him, and now, Legally speaking, you push the guy. That's just because he was threatening your personal space. You can defend that if there's a camera there. Uh, if he now puts his hands up or he comes at you aggressively again, that's all you need. So right. then you go in. Uh, you get control of him. And because standing there and waiting for him, and then suddenly, go, boom, with a headbutt. Um, really hard to deflect the headbutt. Right. You know, it's really, it, really hard. So um, he gets up in your face and you start feeling that this guy might be able to throw a punch really soon or attack. Uh, you're not waiting. You have to intervene with it before it, it becomes a reaction. So, and really, you are reacting. You're reacting to his energy, to his body movement, to everything. Maybe you body position yourself a little bit sideways. Mm -hmm. uh, if he does swing, you know, you deflect it with your shoulder maybe is possible. Mm -hmm. This one is also like like you do the bong sao or you do okanagashi, the Mayweather uh, mm -hmm. boxing thing here. Show, yeah. I've used that a few times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I've used it also like I had once like a, this, was, this, was, this was a lady though. Uh, like I don't I don't really do 
much against women, but she was really mad. I don't know what she was mad at. And I just made a comment, and then she tries to – I was drinking my soda. Mm-hmm. And I was having a straw in my mouth, and she tries to to scratch me or slap me or whatever. And I just deflected with the soda, and I threw the drink at her. And <laughs> that was it. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, obviously you can you can react to situations like that if you know how to tuck your, your chin mm-hmm. down and you deflect – but you, you don't want to end up where you're reacting to a very close distance situation. You're pushing back, tell right. him to go, you know, go away. If he comes at you, then that's that's all the leverage you need uh, legally and, and I don't know, morally. I don't know. Right. Regardless, he's attacking you. So uh, that's what you need. Yeah. And I think so one, you of, attack one, of, the, in one of the aspects, too, and I liked how you talk about that, you know, shove to create some distance. I love teaching a powerful shove. It should be one of those things. Everybody knows how to, you know, get some distance, get somebody away from you, not just backing away from them because they will keep coming. If you back away, yeah. they'll keep encroaching on you. Um, but yeah. also to combine it with a verbal, like you shove somebody, hey, stay away from me. I don't want I don't want any trouble. Then everybody hears like you didn't shove them because you're angry with them. You shove them because you want them out of your face and maybe yeah. you're backed up against a bar, maybe, you know, whatever the situation is, but that verbal part creates a picture with everybody else of, Hey, this, you know, then they turn and look and they hear, I don't want to fight, get away from me, you know, go away. Now you're, you're not painting yourself as the, as the, as the aggressor. And then they see yeah. the other person aggress in against your, your, your verbal boundary that you set. And that can, that can paint things entirely different for how it goes. Uh, should it turn into a legal issue or should it turn into, you know, even a moral issue of who started it? Well, yeah. You back it up and it's like a couple of three-year-olds like, well, he started it. No, he started it. You, how are you ever going to yeah. get to the bottom of that one? Um, so and, and like you said, bystanders might jump in. So right. let's say you you denied entry to like three or four people, and they've been standing there for some people just stand there the whole night. If you're doing mm-hmm. like bouncing, they're standing just mouthing off. They're not even a threat, uh, most likely. But then you have this one crazy guy, and he just has that energy that feeds off to to these other people as well. Mm-hmm. So you got him going off. Now you see ignition in the eyes of these other guys as well because now they see they're they're not just one they're not just two or three now they got a leader and he's right. going to push them into getting involved so when you're taking control of that situation um you don't want to go down to the ground and maybe you drop him and you sit with your knee one on the chin here and one on his kidneys uh you control him uh maybe you put on the cuffs after a while but you often have to pay attention to these other guys because they might jump in as well if they jump in and you're bouncing alone, let's say, you can't be sitting there trying to cuff this guy while the other guy's pulling you off or kicking you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you always have to be aware of, of, of that. And like you said, when you do a hard push, um, I usually do that. You know, I push them away. And now some people that don't understand this will say you're escalating the situation, but you're really not. Mm-hmm. The situation is already here. So, you can escalate a situation by a shove, absolutely. But it's how you do it in life. It's not what you do as so much as how you do it. Yeah, but he's most likely not going to stop. Because right. by experience, you understand that this guy is going to keep going, pushing you, and he might just fire off. Mm-hmm. So you're not escalating it. You're now setting boundaries because he's reached a point. And from here, you know, he's not going to stop. You mm-hmm. allow him to stand there. Uh, eventually, he's going to do a move. So you push him. Now you're taking control of the situation. If he comes, then you you you, you do the physical techniques that you need. Uh, you lock him, you know, put him down, lock him, uh, and stuff like that. So yeah, you're not really escalating uh, in in that specific scenario. You're just setting a boundary. You understand that this guy will keep going regardless, mm-hmm. and he will not stop. Sometimes you do a hard push, and he feels it, and he's like, okay, uh, I don't want to do this, but <laughs> you know, Mo. Most of the situation, well, it's just like, I got pushed. I look bad in front of all the bystanders. Now I got to go in harder. You okay, know, we, but- you mentioned a little bit ago about how people are, are kind of starting to change. There's more crazy people out there. And what I've seen too and heard of is there are people that are very loud. They're, they're agitators. But the minute they run into resistance, they completely crumble. 
And I think that yeah. that's a kind of a new phenomenon that's coming. It's yeah. not entirely new. There have always been people that are that do a lot of barking. And then when it comes time to bite, they don't want to do it. But There's I think more of it today, I think. The, I yeah. think it's a growing thing. And perhaps because they've never they've never trained. They've never felt what it's like to be punched. They never felt what it's like to have hands put on them and how scary it is to have somebody touch you when you don't want to be touched. And they they'll they'll bark and yell and and you know, scream and have a tantrum until that hand comes in. And then they suddenly, Oh my God, what happened? And they, they get, uh, so it could happen that if you show that you're ready to go with hands on and they're not, that could end the end your issue. And that could be, be a part of dealing with somebody who's perhaps mentally unstable. Like I said, you gotta be prepared for them to go though. Absolutely. But uh, yeah. you know, I think there's a, a kind of a new profile of, of violence coming too of people that want to, be real scary until stuff gets real and then they they start crying uh or yeah you know, they crumble and, and we we can't be therapists neither like right. whatever baggage they have in their head you know mm -hmm. we want to protect ourselves and our our uh, dear ones you know if you if you threaten that then mm -hmm. maybe you had a bad childhood or whatever mm -hmm. like we all have something from from the past but you're not supposed to put that on others. So if you threaten someone, then you have to deal with the consequences. Yeah, and the other thing I've noticed of of that, and you know, the, in the natural world, we see you know a pack of hyenas can take down a lion, but what you never see is a lion turn to face a hyena and that hyena step up to them. They'll always go, you know, they'll run because they don't want to face yeah. the, the teeth end of the lion. They want to try to surround him and you know take him where he's weak. And so you can never write off write that off. Like you said, when one, one guy hangs around at the door of the club and he starts gathering up some buddies, you're seeing the pack of hyenas start to assemble. Yeah, you know? that's exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah. So to appreciate, you know, the behavior and it's not making a personal judgment on the person. It's just assessing what the behavior is you're seeing and the behavior should be a yeah. red flag. Um, and that's, you know, I, there are many news articles of, that come out of people that are attacked and, you know, when you hear the description of what happened, you say, oh, there were some red flags that they just didn't even notice. And they ignored, either ignored them or, you know, because they didn't notice them, they didn't even know that anything was wrong. And then they're in the hospital or, or worse. Um, yeah. It happened. Yeah. It, it, there, there's a lot of strange mentalities going on in society, politically and like socially and stuff. But right is right, and if you impose danger or violence on anybody else, then they have the right to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, you say you're going to shoot someone, regardless if you have a pistol or not, uh, you're making a serious threat. Mm -hmm. And if you start crying afterwards because because that person um, puts you down and, and uh, holds you, and you want mommy, but um, you know you have to be a grown up. You know right. you have to. You have to, uh, it's accountability, basically. I think a lot, of, especially teenagers today, they just don't know what accountability is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. your feelings and what you think society is does not determine what reality of the world is. You might have a very good life somewhere and then you come to a different part of the world and here they will not tolerate your behavior, your privileged behavior. I hate to use the word privilege, but right. you, know, you know what I mean. It's like um, um, there are a lot of spoiled people out there, both, you know, yeah. teens, adults and even full adults that that have never oh, yeah. told no that or, you know, or they somehow feel that they're they are entitled to entitled. scream at you or to judge you or to expect you to behave the way they want you to. And if you don't, they will get angry or physically, even physically violent. And to me, hey, that, that, that is not amazing. That's basically it's kind of like, sorry, think about society, but to me, it comes into the, you have to understand what the mindset of somebody who could attack you is like, and yeah. to spot it and realize that it is a red flag. It's, it's, it is a potential danger, you know, just like seeing somebody walk down the street towards you, pull, pulls brass knuckles out of their pocket. You better yeah. acknowledge that that's a potential threat to you. And, um, wow. if you don't, you could be in real trouble. Um, and, and quick uh so that's 100 <laughs> yeah your your reputation and if you're a boss at the company and people talk to you at a certain way 
and you have a certain reputation wherever you're from or what, what you do, it does not matter when it comes to reality with different people and strangers. And you cannot talk to people the way you want to. If you're a narcissist at your job and you start doing that stuff out in reality, you might just meet someone that doesn't put up with it. And now you're in shock because uh, in your day-to-day -day life, everyone puts up with it. Now you think you're entitled because, hey, I'm a CEO at the company and uh, you know who I am. I don't know how many times I've heard that. I I'll have a, for me, it's just a drunk guy or just an idiot that's just being extremely, uh, showing extremely bad behavior. Sure. And now I'm supposed to accept it because he's some somewhat special in his own mind, wherever he's from. No, you're just an idiot. In my, in my perception, you're just an idiot. You have no humility. You have no understanding of what you're doing. You might regret this tomorrow. You might not. A lot of people, they actually hold on to it. They were right. You know, I attacked this guy because um, he had a cooler beer than me. And uh, so I had to attack him. I don't think that him, would be possible. Know, and, <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, they attack you. And they still believe they were in the right the day after. You know, they want to pull a report. I don't know how many times like people file a report against me after they attack me. Right. You know, and I haven't really done anything uh, out of the extreme other than just stopping them and holding them maybe, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then they file a report and they're like, this is not okay. I'm like, did you even, you want me to pull the camera out? Or if, if you see yourself sober, well, some of these people that might just think they're right anyways, but mm -hmm. Well, be think, accountable regardless yeah, of your yeah. alcohol state or whatever state. As somebody who's a huge fan and believer in the right to, to speak freely, there that comes with an obligation and a responsibility. If you if somebody uses that that right of being able to speak freely to threaten somebody else and to pose beyond just words, but to look as though they are preparing to physically uh, back that those words up with action, like to me that is that is the natural th that invites the the uh, the protection. Somebody is allowed to protect themselves, and you know, yes, somebody can say things. You can uh, say something which you know I might disagree with, but you start screaming at me and looking like you're going to hit me. Now you know I need to intercede that before it before I get hurt. And so I, I think these are issues that, uh, that almost everybody should, should understand. I think a lot of martial artists will, will spend some time going through in their head because you, you sort you need to flush all of this out before it becomes in your face. You need to rationalize and, and internalize where your boundary limits are, what, you know, what, how you're going to, going to react, what you're going to react to, what you're willing to absorb and ignore and have some, some, well thought out, I guess, what, what would you call rules of engagement of when is it time to go and to know what it's going to take to make you make that decision of, all right, it's go time. And it shouldn't come out of pride or ego. It shouldn't come out of uh, arrogance, like you talked about earlier. Um, but it should come out of practical protection. And yes, you can let some crazy person spout off whatever they want to, but realize when they're starting to focus their vitriol on you or on somebody who's innocent. Um, you might be the person that's going to protect somebody who's too weak or too incapable of protecting themselves. Um, but that's just kind of make my sure who, everybody's got their own. I, I agree. 100% agree. And make sure whoever you associate with, uh, that this is people that you want to associate with. Right. If you're with a, a friend or a girlfriend or a group of people that's unaware, uh, they cause trouble wherever they go, and now you want to scratch your head afterwards and wonder why you keep ending up in bad situations. Well, you made a lot of bad decisions along the way. Uh, you don't want to be with people that cause trouble. You know, um, like you said, it's when it's time to go, it's time to go. But you, you want to make sure that you you're humble, you're you're uh, respecting yourself, and you have good people around you, and you want the best for yourself and those people. And when it's time to protect them, you do. Um, but make sure that that you know the energy that you send out, it, it comes back mm -hmm. a lot of times. So if you're unaware of that, and I hear this all the time with some people, uh, I don't know why I keep ending up in situations. Obviously, sometimes you do. Regardless, you end up in situations because of a lot of matters. 
Yeah. Some people, they're just in this cycle of really low uh, understanding of the energy to send out. Mm-hmm. And then maybe they have all this stuff packed inside this subconscious. They have all this frustration and stress and uh, aggression that they never let out. And it just comes out in all subliminal ways. And now they end up somewhere with some people and it's a bad situation. And they want to, you know, they lay at the hospital bed with a couple of teeth out. And they're like, poor me. No, you know what? We are all responsible for ourselves. Uh, we are all responsible for what, what decisions we make. Some things happen we are not in control of, so to say, but we have to take accountability and life will test us. Like we spoke of, it will test us. We shall learn or we shall repeat. If you keep repeating, don't scratch your head and go, I'm a victim. <laughs> you know, you're a victim of your own mentality, perhaps. That's true. And I think this applies kind of to, back to the kind of the theme of the show is this, is what is what are the realities of how violence works? versus what we think of it is what it is on the mat you can be just as lack the accountability if you make up your own fantasy version of what violence is and then wonder why didn't it work when i needed it to what was so different from how i trained to what the reality was and to me that's the accountability that an instructor needs and an accountability that that anybody who leads a dojo or even seniors in a dojo need to have it's not just the instructor's responsibility you as a senior other st- younger students look up to you. They will try to emulate you and you're part of creating what that dojo or what that training group is in terms of their martial integrity and their dedication to reality and wanting to increase their confidence by increasing the, the challenge of, of attackers and what they're dealing with so that they can be, when they are faced with reality, it'll seem easier because they've, they've trained tough, tougher in the dojo so they're used to it. Their, their blood pressure won't go up. They won't drop into a dread, adrenalized state. They won't panic because it's like, well, we do this all the time. This is not really a big deal. And that's, that's something yeah. I've learned from a lot of professionals that are like, you know, I never saw one of them ever get into that state of, you know, the eyes start darting around, like what's going on. And they're like, all right, I know how to deal with this. I've done it before. I've seen it, know how it goes. Yeah. It's handled, handle the business and, and, so that's why I wanted to have this episode. I really appreciate you coming on. Were there any thoughts you wanted to have wrap up, wrap up with? Uh, I think, you know, kill your ego in the dojo. Humble your ego. Uh, become aware. Make a good life for yourself. Yep. And uh, don't seek negativity. And whatever you train in the dojo, make sure it makes you a better person. If you have a lot of frustration or you have a lot of, you know, train to the point where you let that out, uh, become aware of your own emotions, and become aware of reality and the situations and respect violence. Um, that was a lot, but you know, something, something within that, become a better human. <laughs> that, that's what we're all something working like on. that. And it, yeah, for those people that, that are listening to this thinking, well, boy, you know, the, either the training I do is pretty far away from that. My goal in this was to kind of just, maybe start opening the door to learning about how violence really is. It's yes, it's, it's scary, but it's not terrifying. It's only terrifying if you have no concept of what, how it really goes. If you learn about it, because I mean, I see people handling live cobras. I would never touch one of those things with a 15 foot pole, but they understand how creatures work. They understand what they can do, what they can't do, how to handle them, how to be around them safely if you have that, you have an understanding. It doesn't mean they're not, those cobras aren't dangerous. They are. You just have to learn how to read the situation, read the, read the animal, uh, and know how to behave and how not to behave. And then you have a chance you, you can survive it. And I think that's, that's the lesson of learning about navigating violence, not just avoiding it entirely and moving to the suburbs, but, uh, you know, but, learn to spot it and then how to deal with it, have the confidence and know that where your, where your strength and your skill are and what they can do and your limitations. It goes along with it. To me, that's all in the accountability part. So excellent. Well, Remy, thank you very much for, for coming on. This is a, a, like one of my favorite discussions ever. So I think this is fantastic. That was, that was a hundred times better conclusion that I had. Yeah. Thank you <laughs> for having me on. I appreciate it. And uh, it's my pleasure. All right. Well, you take care and we'll talk to you again soon. 
You too. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Stay tuned for more episodes. I've got some great stuff on the way very soon. In the meantime, enjoy your training.